Hi guys, my name is Franco Tanelli and today we're going to talk about support, breathing appoggio. I posted many videos describing how to breathe and how to support one's voice. Uh, since the support is the most important thing in technique, we probably have to revise certain things. Yeah. I also would like to answer some questions I receive uh, through mails from some singers, both professionals and uh, amateurs and those who just learn how to sing. And I find that it's uh, very important to uh, point out to certain things before even we start understanding what real appoggio is. So let me say first, appoggio, like any vocal technical term, cannot be understood by just reading a book or by uh, advice from a singer who will tell you something like, you know, support this way or support that way. To really to understand appoggio, you have to go from theory to practice. And practical appoggio is, first of all, a sensation, personal sensation of a singer who is trying to apply this particular technique. Most of the confusions come not from eloquent explanations. We can, we can explain pretty well uh, and I just do it again for you, that uh, appoggio is the multiple application of the muscles. So it's the diaphragmical support, if you say. Strictly speaking, diaphragm cannot support, but we sometimes loosely say we support with diaphragm, meaning that diaphragm plays a great role in support. And it really does. Even those who don't necessarily know how to do appoggio, they still, when they sing, they sing classical music, their diaphragm is working, more or less. The, uh, so the understanding of appoggio is a lot easier, because as I mentioned, uh, there are two movements. The one movement that comes from abdominal muscles that create the main force that creates this uh, compression in the lungs. The diaphragm basically opposes that movement. Why it is opposes that movement? Because it creates a more balanced push, if you like. Diaphragm creates more balanced push than just using the abdominal muscles. That is very well stated in many, many great singers' books. Uh, including Lily Neman, who I admire as a singer and as a teacher, except that uh, in my previous lessons I also mentioned that Lily Neman was um, uh, to blame for so-called placement technique, uh, uh, because she was one of those uh, theoreticians uh, in, in vocal practice that wanted basically to universalize sensations and sensation points, meaning that, for example, uh, if you sing a particular note, uh, if a tenor sings a particular note, he feels it this way or that way exactly. So that was, you know, kind of, um, that was probably the only mistake she made because she wanted to make it universal. Uh, later on, we know that the, uh, the science of singing and the most, you know, uh, prominent singers denied this uh, as, as a universal feeling. And they came to conclusion that every singer has more or less private or personal feeling about those things. And uh, coming to even to appoggio, not necessarily even the sound application, but appoggio. How do we feel appoggio? We feel appoggio different way. And from my own practice, from my uh, my own practice as a singer and my own experience uh, dealing with singers who'd like to uh, understand what appoggio is, uh, I came to conclusion that every singer has different sensations about how do they use uh, this uh, abdominal and uh, diaphragmical movements. Everyone has different strengths of the muscle and uh, when they apply what is necessary for appoggio, they might feel it 
you know, different points or different ways, different places. As me personally, I feel a podio here. So when I apply a podio, when I apply the diaphragm, and when I balance my voice with the diaphragm, I feel it here. Some of you will do feel the same way, but not all of you. So that's important to know that the other students uh, will feel or should feel a podio in the back because that's where uh, some singers will feel the diaphragm. Okay? So you see, uh, it's not universal, it's very particular. How teacher knows if a podio is implied? The teacher has no ideas, of course, what kind of muscles you're using. But the teacher should have a good ear to hear if that application is correct. And how is that? It's very simple. If the sound is not forced, it's not extremely nasal, it's not glottal, that means that a podio is applied correctly. The teacher says that's a correct thing. And then, later on, you have to watch your feelings, your sensations, rather, to understand exactly how do you feel when the teacher says it's correct. That's how we really learn classical technique. Uh, that's why a teacher has to be very, very careful describing how exactly you use a podium, what do you feel or what do you sense when you do it. Because if you, if you insist, if the teacher insists on this particular feeling, it may confuse the student and will try to feel the same thing, it will never get it. So sensations of a podio could be so different. They could be like in the front, like I said, I feel the same, or at the back, or could be kind of equally the same. It could be a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, in some cases, you don't have any distinguished feelings or sensations. What is important that you try to understand the subtle difference between uh, what you did before and what, uh, and what you do when you do it right. So uh, that's uh, the, one of the most important things. So when, when you um, ask me in letters, uh, Frank, oh, please, I, uh, I don't know how to support my voice. My voice uh, gets uh, throatal or glottal or nasal, whatever. And please uh, tell me what to do. Okay, I'll tell you honestly, you know, when my students come, I always comprehensive like I do it in um, like I do it in, in my videos, I explain them theory of support. So they know what's really going on objectively, regardless to their feelings or sensations. That is important knowledge to know, to know how the instrument works. Okay? So, but later on, after that, we get to practical uh, understanding of a poetry. And practical understanding of a podium comes only through relationship between teacher and the student and of course the sound so teacher hears the sound and the sound is of course I can come to and I often come to my students and I show them you know the application where it comes uh, certain things that uh, might help them for example um, if uh, let's say you're frustrated and you try to teach your student to feel a podio right in the front here, and it, it doesn't work, you might use another method. You might put your students, um, let them sit down in a chair and feel their back, you know? That helps sometimes to feel a podio uh, at, for those uh, who actually have sensations in the back. Not all of the tricks I'm telling you here, but there's certain tricks that can help student to finally get it, okay? But it doesn't come with understanding, theoretical understanding, it never comes with understanding theory. So the theory is only a kind of a, a perspective, an understanding of theoretical knowledge. When it comes to practical knowledge, you need to experience. Let's say you're talking to a blind person and try to explain them what is the sunrise or what is the color, you know? You can say, well, red is like a hot color, you know? And you said, okay, I understand. And let's say uh, the green is like a cooler color, you know? So it kind of has association with colors, but it doesn't really, it will never help a blind person to really see the color. Uh, because seeing the color is experience. So that's uh, kind of an analogy with, uh, with uh, sensations that 
the singular experience. Why I'm comparing it with the, with the blind people? Because we, in a way, we're not blind, we're deaf in a certain way because we don't hear ourselves. The most important problems with learning voice technique lies in, in an inability to hear ourselves 100%. We are the only instrument in the world that sings from inside. So we have inside sensation. The teacher should be able to hear the correct and enforced sound. Uh, what I notice is that some singers don't mind having um, a little bit of nasal sounds or a little bit of glottal sounds. For me personally, I try to avoid, as myself as a singer and uh, with my students, totally avoid glottal or nasal sounds. Okay? So that, because nasality, honestly, it's not the most beautiful thing you can ever have. Let me demonstrate. Here's the sound with a poggio. Oh. It has to be free. It has to resonate. Again, my personal sensations are low. The higher I sing, the lower the sensations are. But again, I feel it up front. Some singers can feel it at the back. Oh. Now, why I'm doing this? Because this is a visual effect that uh, affects your subconsciousness. If you use this movement, you don't have to think about lowering your larynx or putting necessarily your uh, holding your diaphragm, which you don't even know, you don't even sense, you don't even feel it in the first place. So uh, this is. Um, let me tell you something. It's very confusing when you think and sing at the same time. So you have to go rather through the feelings or sensations or imagery. So, oh, this is a poggio sound. Now, if you do, um, if you do not apply a good balance with this, the sound can go like this. Oh, right now, it's not an poggio sound. I don't know if you really hear that through this camera, but let me demonstrate it again. Ah, this is a supported sound, but it's not an apoggio. Okay? What's the difference? First of all, there is a little a change in the color. And my diaphragm is collapsing or rising quickly. You know? In comparison to the apoggio sound. Apoggio sound keeps the diaphragm always almost in the same place. Of course, eventually it rises. Relatively gives you a much superior balance and breathing. Another sign of apoggio is that your throat, your jaw, your tongue is not tense. If I see someone uh, singing something like this, something like this adds the sign of the tension. It means the singer does not apply apoggio 100%. So it's very important to see the difference. So apoggio creates absolutely a total control over the voice through breathing. And that's a big difference between apoggio school and the school of support because school supports are different there are many some of them compromise with placement schools meaning that for example if I cannot do it with Apoggio I cannot support my voice pro properly the first thing what I do if I would cover my voice okay the covering eases the diaphragm positions so the, what is the meaning of covering is making sound rounder than it's really in life. So if you try this, applying A to U, changing A to U, you see that you don't need to push your diaphragm, you don't need to have that much balance, but you distort the vowel. And so as I showed before, you sing this is not a poggio, because you're modifying a vowel greatly, okay? So this is a poggio. 
because I am singing pure vowels and I'm just uh, using the diaphragm to balance it and not to make it forceful. But if you don't, if you try to use open and correct vowel during production of this particular uh, uh, sound, you might end up uh, being glottal. Let's say I want to produce pure vowel. You see, you, you, you heard my nasal, it's too nasal, or it could be done like this. And this is a glottal sound. Why it is occurring as a glottal sound? Because this, uh, um, we do not apply properly the opposition of the diaphragm, and therefore the tension comes too much tension comes to your vocal cords and they start to distort the sound and it becomes either glottal or nasal or both or in other ways not so beautiful sound okay uh, some singers do use that you know but uh, they got used to it if they don't know apoggio the sound turns into a, an ugly duck you know and uh, that's unfortunate because i think personally that everyone every singer can have a beautiful voice if he applies apoggio it will be a different voice, not the same, but it will be a consistent sound at least. And consistency, as we know, is the most important thing in the beauty of the voice. You might like a darker voice, you might like a lighter voice, even a little bit of nasality like um, Alfredo Kraus, you know. But Alfredo Kraus had a very consistent voice. That's why I can call him a beautiful voice when he sang a certain repertoire. So the consistency is the key to the beauty. Uh, for my taste, consistency and plus the roundness, which is an Italian school. So it's ah, not this. Ah, ah. This is the sound that Italians like, not only in voices, but the instruments they make. Thank you very much. This was Franco Tanelli. Until next time.